Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Sean Mann in the house, our most loyal and faithful book group member. I think you and I uh, and, and Tonya and uh, actually Tihara wasn't here. So me, you and Tonya have the, uh, uh, the highest attendance award, man. Good seeing you again. Good to see you. Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. No, that's fine. And as usual, Sean, the beer game is tight, man. The beer game is tight. Yes, sir. Hey, Isabel. What's up? Darius, we see you. Uh, Diane also has been to many of these. Hey, Don. Hey, Don Leary. What's up, family? We'll give folks a few more minutes uh, to jump on. Um, J hey. Jennifer, one other thing that I was going to say about um, policy link. Um, so, sorry, y'all, we were just doing some small talk before y'all jumped on. This is what happens in a book group. Um, uh, they um, seeded the organization that I was with before I joined the Community Foundation, an organization called the Democracy Collaborative. Yeah. And they talk about it all the time. They said when nobody else would even talk to them, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, um, policy link, uh, uh, not policy link, Angela gave uh, them their first grant when she was at Rockefeller right before she left. Oh, so, wow. so yeah, she was just, she is, not was, she is amazing for sure. Yeah. 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 Rockefeller. Well, all right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. It's first of all, it's good to see y'all again. Um, Welcome uh, to um, our book group. Of course, the last one of uh, the calendar year. Um, just in case you forgot, my name is Ronnie um, and I'm a senior fellow with uh, the Community Foundation. And uh, we've been hosting these conversations, Tonya, for a, a year and a half, couple of years now, um, really yeah. as a place for us to learn, practice, uh, community, uh, build community uh, with each other, uh, and hopefully actually to uh, take some of what we're learning here into the work that we're doing at the foundation uh, and in the world. Um, so again, thank y'all for joining. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do so, you know, we like to keep the chat box on and popping. We like to keep it hot. Um, so if you could just uh, help us uh, get to know each other. It's been a while since uh, we've been together. If you could put your name uh, in the chat box, where you live or work in the region and drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. Um, you probably saw this in the reminder email, but want you to start um, thinking about this if you haven't and to share this in the chat box. What line or story from the book moved you the most? What line or story in the book moved you the most? And I had like 40 of them, <laughs> um, but I'm gonna just share mine just as an example. Um, Jennifer, I was just, I, I continue to be moved by the just very short phrase, um, aligning philanthropy with the soul of democracy. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I, I, Tonya, the, it hits you right here, right? Aligning philanthropy with the soul of democracy. And I just want to say, and y'all know I can get preachy, uh, but I'm not, I, I, would, I had lost sight of whether or not our democracy even had a soul, given all the uh, rancor that's in the political public square. And that statement um, hit me right in the middle of my chest in such a great way. And so, so, anyway, so if there's something like that in the book that's like short and pithy, um, or if there was a longer pericope, you don't have to type the whole thing, but something that like points to um, a meaningful line or story or topic um, uh, in the book. Um, so if you could start sharing that in the chat box, your name, where you live and work in the region, and uh, something uh, about the book uh, that moved you, we want to use that in our uh, conversation 
uh, together. And so um, just real quick, as usual, we would be completely out of order um, if we didn't um, bring our president and CEO, Tonya Wellens, uh, to the mic. Tonya, I just want to say again, um, thank you again for your fearless leadership in uh, kind of really marshalling all the different parts of the Greater Washington Community Foundation family across the regions, uh, across the region, which a lot of times is competing with each other. Uh, somehow or another, we've been able to get aligned. I've heard you say um, with our strategy around the racial wealth gap, advancing economic mobility and working in neighborhoods, um, th getting aligned around the most bold and courageous vision in the foundation's 50 year history. That's a testament to you. It's of course, it's a testament to this community. And um, and thank you for creating the conditions that we could have this learning space together and to practice what it means to be in community with each other. So thank you for that. Uh, please share a few words before we move on on our agenda. My pleasure. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, I just want to say a huge, but first, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all this morning. Thank you for spending this time with us. You could be anywhere in the world, um, but we appreciate that you chose to, to spend the morning with us. I really want to give a special uh, welcome and thank you to our um, our, our author, uh, Jennifer, uh, for joining us at uh, dark, very, it's still dark in, in San Diego where she is. Um, but we really appreciate you um, you spending this time with us this morning. Our ambition is to practice courageous philanthropy. Um, I'll say that we don't have all the answers. We're in search of them. And I think this, uh, this conversation will continue to help us uh, refine and reflect on what we do right here in the greater Washington region. So again, good morning. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, Ronnie and Tierra for pulling this all together. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you, Tonya. Um, so just real quick, um, uh, as we do on every call, today we're gonna do a little audience participation. We're gonna do a little audience participation. So um, I, when I checked in with Jennifer um, earlier this week, I was giving her, and Jennifer, wave your hand in the air like you just don't care. We're not, we haven't introduced you yet, uh, but we're gonna bring you out here in a second. Um, but we referred to you a couple of times, but um, I was sharing with her the trajectory of books that we have read. And y'all, y'all, this is a pretty impressive, <laughs> this is a pretty impressive uh, list of books. And so I just want to go through these real quick uh, to see if like for folks, if you were in the book talk, if you remember anything in particular um, from the book or the book talk um, that uh, we could bring back into uh, the conversation, just as a reminder. Uh, and if you can't remember, don't this is not like a, a pass fail test. Just want to try to um, um, reestablish our memory. And we do have a website with recordings of all of these. So we'll send that to you just in case you need a refresher. All right. But the first book we read was Cats by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, anybody remember that book? Like what was like, what was like a big headline or a big moment for you um, uh, from that book? Anybody want to jump on the mic and, and share? And by the way, I just decided to do this. In this I will moment. jump in. I will Go jump ahead. in. Who's this? Last, let, it's Diane. Hi. Hey, Diane. <laughs> Hi. Um, gloves, Paula, cookies, the whole nine yards going on. But uh, Cass left an indelible mark on me. Um, the For me, the most powerful, um, well, two most powerful moments in Cass. She talks about going to India and having um, Black Americans compared to Dalits. Um, that was crazy. Um, but to me personally, as a Jew, um, even more so, um, recordings of the Nazis watching how um, Americans um, ran Jim Crow South and modeling some of their early policies on that um, and remarking at points that things were too cruel and they wouldn't be able to make them fly. I, I mean, you know, what could stick with you more than that? Yeah. Good summary. Good summary. And happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Yes. 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 Okay. And then I think the book we read after that, um, uh, 
uh, Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, What Racism Cost Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Anybody remember a moment from that book or the discussion? And I'm not going to ask Sean to answer all of these because he was at every book group. So, Sean, we're not going to put that pressure on you. Actually, I, I missed uh, those first two. I started, oh, I think, at, uh, man, yeah. <laughs> at the 10-part yeah, the, the series, uh, the articles. That was the first one I came to. Okay, so we're going to save that one for you. Um, well, I'll jump in on this one. I remember two things. I remember the pool story. I don't know if y'all remember um, when the South started desegregating, um, the uh, white people in the South said, and, and they started desegregating the pools and the public facilities, white folks in the South said, well, if we got to use it with black folks, we'll just get rid of the pool or we'll fill it with concrete. And that how that like plays out in the public square in the kind of sharing of public goods. Um, if we can't have it to ourselves, we'll burn it down. Right. And so sorry, so that was like, whoa, right? Like what what and and she talked about how that shows up in the South in particular in the schools, right? And how the schools are underfunded and resourced and so on and so forth, because of this um thing of if it's if we can't have it to ourselves, we'll just actually walk away from it. The other thing I remember um, is if you re remember, we had a, a panel that ended up being all black people. It was it was started out as a black white conversation about the book, and the day of the book talk, um, all the white folks dropped out of the panel. They were on the call, but they said, uh, you know, I don't feel comfortable being on the panel. So okay, cool. And I remember um, Timmy from If Tiffany, the racial equity officer in uh, Montgomery County. Um, there are a couple of other folks, um, um, Carla Bruce from Fairfax County, they were talking about the book. And I remember them saying how exhausted they were. They appreciated the book, but the book was not for black people. It was for other people that were trying to learn about racism, not the people who were experiencing racism. And they were exhausted trying to convince people that racism cost all of us. And I remember Timmy saying, this is y'all's work, not our work. And it was a moment of real vulnerability. And then Stu Edelstein, I don't know if Stu has made it on the call. Stu, who's also Jewish, said, I'm exhausted too. And there was just this moment of like shared vulnerability and honesty that we hadn't had in the book group. And I remember that moment and wanting us to try to capture that over and over again. So I remember that from that group. Let's just pick one more because um, we could do this all day. Uh, the biggest one was the 1619 Project. We had over 100 people showed up for that one. Anybody remember um, uh, any highlights uh, from the 1619 Project discussion or the book if, as you read it on your own? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, not necessarily the, the book specifically, but um, one thing I think that kind of highlighted the importance and the, the impact of the book was the um, uh, Trump administration's uh, response to it and trying to get a bunch of um, uh, people to write, uh, you know, their, their own curriculum, their own history uh, in response to it. I think that showed that it had a uh, really broad like cultural impact in the US um, and may have actually boosted it more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that also like points to the power of, you know, sharing this information and um, pointing out the, yeah, the um, I guess, like foundations of, of slavery in the US um, and, and in the founding of the US and how people, some people are worried about that, uh, you know, truth getting out, I guess. Nice, nice. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. All right. So we've read a lot and um, we've done a lot of good learning together. And uh, as a foundation family, we're always interested in the transition from what we're learning together to how we act in the world together. So we want to pay attention to that for sure. Next slide. Um, 
So the last book we read was uh, From What Is to What If. Uh, this is a book by uh, Rob Hopkins. And um, I just wanted to share a couple of quotes from that book because it creates a nice bridge between uh, Hopkins' book and the book that we read for our talk today, uh, Courageous Philanthropy. Um, I'm going to read this out loud. Um, and I think you'll, the bridge will be uh, appear and become apparent for us. We live in a time bereft of such stories, stories of what life could look like if we were able to find a way over the course of the next 20 years to be bold, to be brilliant, to be decisive, to act in proportion to the challenges we are facing and to aim for a future we actually feel good about. And then the next quote from the Hopkins book is, <laughs> and if there was ever an organization and a body of work and a group of people and a story that lived up to this quote, it is the story that you're about to hear uh, about uh, from our um, author, Jennifer Vanica. The only thing we pro proposed to do was to change the world. The rest we have improvised, right? And so uh, we took the road and the road appeared as we took every step. Um, Tonya, plug your ears because I'm about to be a little crass here in a second. Uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, this is, we said yes to creating change to each other. The rest, we just made that shit up. Like, because, be, because the answers to the big questions had not yet appeared and we were committed to learning and acting together. And so... This is the story that uh, uh, I think uh, that is embedded in the book by our author who is joining us today, Jennifer Vanica, the author of Courageous Philanthropy, Going Public in a Closely Held World. Um, I put like the kind of formal bio from um, her website in uh, the chat. You can read that on your own, but y'all should know that I met Jennifer uh, E let's just say eons ago. I don't even know when that was. It must have been about 2005, four, five. We were babies. <laughs> I was working for the Annie E. Casey Foundation in Atlanta, and we were engaged with a play in a place-based strategy. And just in case y'all forgot, the Community Foundation also, over the course of our 10 years, we have a place-based strategy. We've identified priority neighborhoods in the region that are struggling the most, we're trying to figure out how do we use everything that we have and who we are to bring the world to the neighborhoods that matter the most to us. And But how do we do that in a way that centers the people who are in those neighborhoods, their leadership, their ambitions, um, and their quality of life? And so this is what Jennifer and her team were doing uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, and um, I remember Jennifer um, going out to San Diego from Atlanta with the contingent from Casey and seeing what y'all did there. And it completely turned my world inside out. And um, there, there are lots of things in my life trajectory that I have learned along the way that I've tried to carry with me and say, as I'm building the world, I want to do it a little bit like that. What you and your team and those residents did in San Diego, I've carried with me since then. And I'm hopeful that more and more folks pick up that story, the practice, the culture, the fearlessness, the love, and the courage to do likewise. And so thank you so much for joining us from the West Coast, by the way, she's in San Diego. Um, and so um, I want to turn it over to you again to say thank you. Tell us a little bit about the book. I think you have a short video that... Um, Tiara will tee up as soon as you tell her to, and then we'll have some discussion with each other. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Marla. Sorry, I just came off screen. I didn't see y'all. I see Alan. Yep. Glad y'all joined us. Um, uh, after you talk, we'll have some open discussion and plenary about the book, answer the questions and things of the like. So Jennifer, thank you again. Oh, yeah. It's nice to have coffee with you guys this morning. <laughs> uh, you know, it was struck by your list of books and, you know, wish that I'd had a few of those myself back in the day when we were doing Market Creek. Um, one of the books that I remember from that era, the early the kind of mid nineties um, 
was The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. Do you, any of you know that book? <laughs> so just from the title, you can tell, um, you know, you're when you're in a foundation, you're in a structure that's intrinsically about power and privilege. And what what do you do? Like, what would you do differently if you had an open field? And I think as a project, most people think of Market Creek as a project. It was about getting rid of an industrial dump and getting the first grocery store to, <laughs> to serve 88,000 residents that hadn't been served by one before the, the term food desert had even been created. Um, but more importantly, I think Market Creek was about a process rather than a project. It was kind of a pinky swear. <laughs> you know? And for many of our funding community, it was like being on a 12-step program <laughs> because <laughs> we weren't we weren't used to this idea of giving up control over decisions and um you know, actually working in a community resident led process. We kept slipping back and having to make it up another rung. It was uh, quite a journey, but um, but the but fundamentally, it was about understanding that who decides matters. And if place matters, then who decides becomes even more and more important. And there was a um in my book, I talk about the lessons from goats, which um, the Jacobs family sent me to Cairo to do some work. And uh, when we were out in the villages, um, you'd see these big economic projects kind of popped in a village <laughs> and abandoned. And then when you ask villagers why, they would say, we never really wanted it in the first place. We wanted goats. <laughs> we wanted, you know, things we could relate to. And um, it, when we started thinking about it, I mean, we're notorious in the foundation field for that. We do some research at arm's length and determine what's in somebody else's best interest <laughs> based on our frame of reference, right? With perhaps no context um, of what indigenous experience would would tell you and there there was a story that I'll just take a minute to tell because I think it's so great and there's a TED talk on it if you want to see it but it was Ernesto um I just forgot Ernesto's last name uh he was an Italian aid, aid worker that went to uh Zambia to work on food shortages. And he, when he got there, he realized that the Zambezi ri River was this really fertile ground. And he tried to get everybody organized to plant. Nobody would, <laughs> would get engaged in it. So he and his team went ahead and started planting and everything looked great. The zucchinis were lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and then one night, um, 200 hippos came out of the river and ah. trashed, trashed the village. <laughs> and he said he was shocked, but what shocked him more than anything was that nobody else was shocked <laughs> but him. And um, he goes, I used to feel really bad about it because he said, why didn't you tell me? And they go, you never ask. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said he felt really bad until he saw what the British and the French and the Americans were doing in Zambia. <laughs> and he said, at least we fed 200 hippos. <laughs> so, you know, we do this all the time. And we really just at that moment asked ourselves what would happen if we didn't. You know, like that was like the big idea right behind it all was just you know let's go 
and move our office to the community that we had relationships in that we were that had been historically disinvested and try not to do that <laughs> what would it what would it look like you know if you actually really um honored the expertise within communities and um, really ask people. And there, there was a woman in one of the working teams who said that her Mexican grandmother had this line, don't do about me without me. <laughs> and that became one of my famous kind of go-to lines personally is, never do about somebody without somebody, you know, that, um, that we had to really figure out how to do this differently. So we were on a path to listen and put whatever outside expertise was needed by the resident teams but they would guide who was needed at the table and what kind of help would be provided in any given moment. And one of my big lessons was just start wherever you are. Don't, don't wait to get it all figured out. Um, just actually letting it grow organically and flexibly over time I think led to so many magical moments. And when our backs were against the wall and stuff wasn't working is when we actually had some of the most brilliant breakthroughs that would come <laughs> from people in the community teams. So, you know, uh, and, and I'll just tell one little story. Um, residents wanted an amphitheater in the middle of this grocery project on this brownfield and the army corps of engineers wouldn't let us use the creek bed to build kind of stadium <laughs> seating and there wasn't enough room on this site um so joe jacobs my boss said i'll send you to washington to lobby the army, army corps of engineers <laughs> i tell people i would still be in washington lobbying the army corps of engineers <laughs> 30 years later but in the team meeting one of the residents said well what can you put in a creek and it changed the conversation because all of the the people who saw themselves as experts you know went right to you know our political frame of reference and the way this person asked the question was the breakthrough because somebody else yelled a dock and the if you go to market creek there's a dock <laughs> with full stage production capability in the middle of the creek <laughs> it was permitted as a dock so you know we were always having those kind of experiences I think over time I saw that my job was being in the barrier business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my, my job was just, oh, we hit a hit a barrier, you know, let's get a team around it. Who are the people on those teams that can help get the breakthrough and try to remove that barrier and go on to the next thing? Um, so it was a constant process of allowing people the flexibility to hit barriers and to try to figure out what was needed to get through that barrier and um, and to protect the process. That was the other important role that I had was safeguarding the process. And if you're going to give up control of decisions, the process really matters. Um, we could be having this conversation with our Congress as we speak. You know, how do you get participatory planning that is biased towards action um, 
is really important. And we use participatory planning methods that allowed people across eight, eight or nine different cultures. Everything was um, uh, translated. Everybody had translation equipment in real time. Um, and we were able to get work moved constantly. And every 90 days, those teams met and advanced whatever direction they were going. We won a graffiti art project. We <laughs> work on safe neighborhoods. Um, over time, it turned out to be about 44 working teams. But let me stop there and show you the video because, and I edited it down to try to get it to just a few minutes, but it's really helpful, I think, to see residents and to put the residents in the room a lot. We followed them around with cameras for about 17 years. And so we have a lot of the real-time action and real-time interviews um, with people who are engaged in the process over time. And then some of the reflections that residents had um, toward the book. So um, can we can we cue that up? Yep. It's really about us having a place, having your voice, being heard, really being heard, being part of community. That's called mutual respect. What do you need, right? How can I help you accomplish some of the things that you need? Not do it for you, but how can we do this uh, together where it's mutually beneficial in a mutually respectful way? If you don't ask what someone needs, you end up giving, and you're giving the wrong thing. And, and uh, the outcomes are not always positive, or they don't always stay, they don't have that staying power. So I think they're asking, what is it that you need? What do you want? What are your dreams? What are your visions? You can shape this building in a way that it has more culture by adding the awnings, the balconies. When I asked all of the teams to bring something from their culture, and when they put those textiles on the table and they all stood there in silence. We saw that all of our cultures had very primary colors and certain motifs and certain designs that were binding to all of us. I think that's where we saw our strength. We came up with the idea that children should be part of this project, not just adults. And it was really important to have kids involved. Art is not only a great unifying uh, community organizing strategy, art is a great vehicle for having the discussions that need to take place among various communities. First time in our own neighborhood, look like we're going to get an opportunity to play a role as a major builder. We have uh, probably 110 employees, uh, over 80 of them were hired from the community right here. We knew that it was possible to set up a corporation so that stock could be sold and members in the community could purchase the stock. We had to decide how people would qualify, who would qualify, how we would go out and outreach that. There were 271 individual investors, 33 youth adult partnerships, 100 married couples that invested, six nonprofit organizations, including some churches. I want you to understand that this, your being here tonight for this occasion, is nothing less than a miracle. You have made this giving me an opportunity to not leave my daughter with money matters, but to teach her that her money can matter. We did this work in every community. We would have less hate crimes. We would have more people 
um, realizing, oh my God, they're a human just like me. It brought a lot of hope to many of us who didn't have any hope anymore. I mean, we, I didn't envision all this at one time, so it changed my whole way of thinking. It's changed my whole outlook on life, and I think it's done that for many residents here. Look what we did. We had a vision, it was built, and now this community owns it. And if they don't see that, they've missed a big part. Because it is, it is the most important piece that this community came together in a place where I'm sure the odds against, I couldn't even tell you how many different cultures, how many different languages that come together to purchase and to share in a piece of their community. And so it's something that we can take out to the world and say, hey, look, you can do this too for communities that they call underserved or unempowered. Look how powerful you can be. Courage is what it takes to stand and speak, but courage is also what it takes to sit and listen. That's exactly what the Market Creek experience was about. Figuring out how to really deeply listen and then deliberate together, decide together, and take action together. The book certainly is about our belief in each other and our human capacity for courage and caring and connection. We are better together, we have more endurance together, and we are our most courageous and caring selves together. And tell people, you have a chance for ownership. You have a chance for your voice, for your legacy to be passed on to your children. Together we actually pulled off one of the most unusual and courageous IPOs in history. We, and we were able to create jobs. We were able to break so-called gang territorial lines. It was so much excitement learning about humanity and affirming humanity that people forgot about a lot of the negativity. This book actually raises the question, if philanthropy's job is to act in the public interest, does it have an obligation to hear the public voice? I'm really hoping that this book is used as a guide a manual, a blueprint for people, organizations, institutions to make change. If you're passionate about anything in life and you want to give back, you should read the book. Nice, nice. Jennifer, you may want to give like another 10 minutes or so of comments. Um, and then I want to open it up and like have folks mix, mix it up with you. Um, but any any other thoughts or reflections before we move to plenary? Yeah, I, I we didn't know where the process would lead, but where it led us was to this commitment of of redefining and fully trying to embrace ownership that when you think about how change happens, um, typically with adult learning theory will tell you, you can tell somebody they need to change, but unless they're in the room, unless you, you are in a situation that forces you to learn, it's, it's unlikely that you're gonna have a really significant change. And so, we were all in the room and that made us realize that we all had to own our own change. I think in the foundation world, it, it, it seems typical to, at that time to say, if you just change, everything will be okay. Instead of realizing that um, perhaps the biggest change needed to happen with those of us on the foundation side of our work um, that we needed to really understand how we were complicit in the issue and be willing to keep ourselves in tough situations. <clears throat> I had many foundations in our network tell me that it was the first time they'd been called a racist. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> so, 
Um, it was shocking, I think, at first, um, but people really stayed at the table. And that that became our mantra that we all had to own our own change. When it came to community planning, people, because we were committed to resident-led work, that meant that residents needed to own the plans, that we weren't going to come in and implement something that hadn't really come out of real ownership of those plans um, in the neighborhood. But it, it's kind of like that line that people were using a lot about give a man a fish and he'll eat today, teach a man a fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. At some point we were like, you know what, if they don't own the pond, you know, what happens with the kids and the grandkids? Because in the foundation world, um, we wonder why things aren't sustainable. But when we leave communities, we still have the major assets sitting in our own bank accounts that and it's never really controlled by the community. And then we wonder, <laughs> I mean, foundations invented sustainability, right? <laughs> like it's called a portfolio. And we know full well how to make things sustainable. We just don't <laughs> because we want to stay in control of it. So it was about not just owning the plans, although what we found is that by owning the plans, that's where vision occurred. That's where hope occurred. That's where the power of coming together and envisioning something that people are going to tackle just really took root. But they also needed to own the implementation because we heard a lot of stories about, you know, this thing gets planned, the outside contractors come in and build the buildings and we don't see anybody ever again. We have no long-term voice and anything that goes on. So people needed to own the implementation and that's where skills get built. San Diego only at that time had 2% minority contractors on public works jobs. That's pretty bad. And so this was a big enough, they called it big dirt. It was big enough dirt <laughs> that, you know, we could, we could build a set of, um, of full contractor status folks that could handle public works jobs after after taking this on. So it was owning every aspect of how the project got implemented and um, putting a team with whoever needed support in that. If you might work the construction site during the day, but you might be in contractor training in the evening <laughs> or uh, however you wanted to see it happen. And, and then thirdly, buying the pond. How, how does that asset become fully owned by the community. And people don't want, they're, they don't want to live next to an industrial dump, but they're also afraid of gentrification the minute that dump gets taken out. And so the conversations led us to, if, if, if it's gonna throw off profits, how do those profits go back into neighborhood residents' pockets. So um, a structure was created where residents wanted a balance of individual and community benefit. They believed that self-interest is a good thing. And if they were making money off the project, that was a good thing. But they also could see that self-interest can also have a downside. <laughs> that, uh, the uses of the buildings could shift if people were just going towards profit. Um, and um, they wanted to make sure that local entrepreneurs got a shot at, um, at a couple of the buildings that were on the project that weren't necessarily there for profit. So they wanted a community benefit balancing the self-interest. And that evolved into an organization called the Neighborhood Unity Foundation. 
which is essentially a community foundation. Um, there were a thousand residents involved in planning it, but it was controlled and run by community residents and it would um, raise its money to buy stock in the project. And for the self-interest, we would do an IPO. <laughs> Uh, the Department of Corporations was really confused. <laughs> They'd never seen anything quite like it. And um, it took us six years and three tries until we got the permit to go public. And um, it was really magical. That was uh, that scene where <laughs> Reverend Kakai was going, this is nothing less than a miracle that that this has occurred. So there were 400, we could take 450 investors without having to go to the SEC. So we had to stop it at 450, but over time we envisioned a series of these that could eventually be put in a real estate investment trust and, and go more broadly. So it was about owning the planning, owning, every bit of that vision, owning the implementation and all the benefit that comes from contracts as well as the training and then um, owning the asset itself mm -hmm. and putting those profits back in the, in the neighborhood. And there was also a piece about owning how success got defined at any given part of the project. Um, because people were used to outside evalu evaluators coming in, <laughs> again, making assumptions. Um, and the evaluations themselves would get people off track uh, because they would start only heading towards what the evaluators <laughs> wanted to see. And so there were teams at every turn evalu defining how success would be evaluated and putting putting that out jointly among the teams at the end of every year. So, Jennifer, can I jump in? Can you take yes, about like two more minutes? Because I'm I'm seeing people chomping at the bit to jump yeah, in and please, talk with you. No, the please do. Let's talk yeah. about. No, no, please you... wrap. Go. You can go ahead and finish. No, your no. Talk. I think that's a kind of a it in a nutshell. And let's talk about what you'd like to talk about. Outstanding, outstanding. And there's so much more to this story y'all. Um, and I think we picked like four chapters uh, for folks to focus on. And the last one is uh, the, I think it's the utterly simple idea, I think is the title of the uh, chapter. And if you read the last word of the chapter, this is the utterly simple idea. And that last word is ownership, ownership. And so I knew that was going to happen, but sorry, hold on y'all. My wife is traveling and she is trying to FaceTime me. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, but let's pivot to um, open discussion. And I want to um, bring back in the question we asked in the beginning. Um, and a couple of you answered directly and some are still pondering. Um, uh, I do want to uh, pick on uh, Darius and Isabel because you answered the question very directly. So be, you have your wheels turning. And if you're not ready, that's cool. But like you had, you had something pretty powerful. Uh, but the first question was what line from the book? And if you haven't had a chance to go through the book, what from the video and Jennifer's talk um, is drawing you in? It's making you go, wow, or I didn't know that, or I want to hear more about that, or that was meaningful and profound for me or challenges me, right? So that's the first question. And then after we reflect on that, there are two more. Jennifer, I just want you to listen in to the, our community talk and then like offer any perspective. So the second question is gonna be, where have you seen philanthropy, particularly our philanthropy as a family um, or where you do philanthropy, where have you seen it be courageous? Act in courageous ways. And I'm looking at some of you on this call some of you have like back against the wall, done some amazing things. You shouldn't even be here given the stuff that you've done and how power and privilege have reacted to you. 
And so, first of all, thank you for your courage. And we want to talk about those moments when um, philanthropy has been courageous. And then the third question we're going to reflect on, we're going to take like five or six minutes for each, for, for each question. Where should or could philanthropy be more courageous, particularly given uh, what we're hearing from this particular story um, about San Diego, the Jacobs Family Foundation, and these residents that Jennifer had the privilege of working with. So, right, so those, those are going to be the three questions. Um, so the first question, what line from the book, uh, and we're just going to save them a couple of minutes on what it meant, um, and then we'll pause to see what we're learning. Uh, what line from the book moved you, or story from the book moved you, or from Jennifer's talk or the video? Floor is open. Good morning, um, Ronnie. I put my uh, quote from, I believe it was from- Darius, the tell them who you are. Darius, tell them who you are. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Darius Graham. I'm the new managing director of community investment at the Community Foundation. I've been uh, here for about two months and have just had a wonderful uh, start. So. Glad to be part of this conversation. Um, so I put my uh, the quote that resonated with me from the first part of the book that I was able to get through in the chat. But Ronnie, on what sort of um, is sort of um, in my mind at the moment, based on the video and what I've heard so far, is even just thinking about creating the space for people to come together and share openly and to and to have the opportunity to raise that question of what goes in the creek. Like I'm thinking of. How do we create those very intentional, open, honest spaces where people have sort of like ownership of the space to even say uh, questions that challenge the prevailing way of thinking? Thank you, Darius, and welcome to the family again. Who else? <laughs> Isabel, I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hello, this is my first book club. Didn't realize I'd get called on. <laughs> it's a classroom setting. <laughs> um, I also just focused on the chapters that were called out. And there were many things that that stood out to me. And I honestly would have outlined it and flagged if I knew we were we could like type them in. Um, the thing that I flagged was similar to what Darius flagged. I, I forget which chapter it's in. Uh, maybe the second set of chapters we were supposed to, the second chapter that you flagged in your list. Uh, but it kind of focused on the, uh, we are the ones who define the lack of issue. We define how we're going to solve problems by the lack of issues instead of being kind of looking at ourselves and kind of assessing how we're supposed to approach situations. We're kind of, we in the philanthropy world or I've done grants work in even the mostly government sector. You know, you you come up with your theory of change, your how you're going to assess, and everything has to fit within those buckets, right? And if they don't, then you don't fund them, or or it's a fail, or whatever it may be. So I thought it was interesting that you call that out because that is like such a that is how most places I've worked does their work by following these sets of standards or. Uh, processes and it's not necessarily part of like that collective change approach. Um, so uh, that that stood out to me. And I don't know if you want to if you want to build on that. If that was a challenging thing to um, convince um, those who are working with you, you know, not in the community but outside of the community, that you, we you, we have to think outside the box. There's not something that we have to keep fitting into a specific standard. You know, just a quick comment on that. I, I um, use this example in the book that if African Americans and women had been at the table when our founding fathers were cooking up the plan for the land of the free and the home of the brave, they would have seen the contradiction, right? Huge, huge contradiction. And a lot of the work had to do with identifying those contradictions at every step. And what happened was that it allowed us to see in our blind spots in a way that made almost everything work 
You know, there were very few, th I mean, things were going wrong all the time, but over the course of its history, there was very little that crashed and burned um, because we had that diversity of perspectives at the table. And um, that was really big. And I think over time, while it was shocking and <laughs> felt like the 12 step program uh, for our network of outside funders and resource partners, um, they they won they came to see how how much it contributed to success and two they had a blast <laughs> they they suddenly were having a really good time because you know instead of going to meetings and talking about the most entrenched issues of our day they were doing learning Samoan dancing or they were having a graffiti art class. <laughs> they were they were really people took seriously that we had to have real relationships, you know, for this to work. Um, and it really paid off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any any other like moments in the book or in the talk or in the video that stand out for folks? Yes, thank you. I think you still have cookie batter stuck to your finger and it's messing up the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's, you know, like the phone, you touch the screen and it works. With the computer, you have to use a mouse. <laughs> that's right, that's right. This one is a trackpad, not the mouse. Not this one, don't do anything. No. I'm a mess. Anyhow, um, you know what struck me when you were talking um i often think like i see something that's super effective and i want to jump in and talk about how do we scale that and as jennifer was talking about um you know letting the stakeholders drive the process i think there's um an interesting challenge and in, yeah in in replicating what works but still leaving space to let the um, the new stakeholders, as you're expanding, there's always a new group of stakeholders involved. Because um, gosh, if we could just replicate everything that's working out there, just you know, imagine where we would be. So I wonder if you could, you know, just talk to that. How would you how would you scale San Diego? Right? Can we put that in Crown Heights? We um, we called it the R word. <laughs> we didn't let people talk about the R word. Um, I think people want to replicate, but that's where you have to distinguish between the project and the process. Because if you're using the process, it's going to lead you to a very different project or set of projects, and it's gonna look very different. But the process is, I think where you, where we as a, a community of people that care about <laughs> our community, um, where we learn cooperative decision-making, where we learn the differences among cultures and how beautiful that is when you get it in the room. Um, that's where you get to me, philanthropy working at the heart of democracy, right? You're, you're, it was a huge F like most of our meetings had 400 people in them. So we were practicing <laughs> democracy. We were practicing civic engagement and civic decision-making in, in its very best form. Um, and the process is something that anybody can use, but it's based deeply in real relationships because when things get hard, somebody is going to come and say, Jennifer, wait a minute, if they know who I am, right? It really depended on all of us having real relationships and 
not being afraid of criticism and being really open to deep, deep listening. Can I can I jump in on that, Jennifer? And Tonya, I'm not trying to um, steal any of the foundation's thunder with the Voices project that uh, me, you, Darius, other folks are working on. But um, we're going to be putting um, uh, some so sharing some data with the region every couple of years. We hire the Gallup poll organization to actually like talk to people about how they're experiencing life in the region. And this question of, um, we asked the question about jobs and health and safety and all kinds of things. But one question we asked was, um, talk about the level of influence that you feel like your voice has in the decisions in your community. And we asked this question, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, DC, um, the places we're at in Northern Virginia, and well over three quarters, no matter race, no matter the class, no matter the geography, said, I have little to no voice in the decisions that impact my community. And so this question of like how philanthropy does its work, Jennifer, this is why that statement about philanthropy and the soul of democracy, as a community foundation, community is in our name. Right. It just how we actually can kind of reteach or reimagine, create spaces. Darius said this, where we are practicing what it means to deliberate, decide with each other. Like we could be a part of actually saving and evolving our democracy at a time that it seems to be falling apart. And so I just, it, that's why that statement struck me so much. I know I'm supposed to be a facilitator here, but I just couldn't, I couldn't resist this given um, your comment. And um, when Tonya and I talked about like this book group, part of what you talked about adult learning, part of what we wanted to do, Jennifer and fa Foundation Family, is we wanted to create a space where people from different walks of life in our community could actually come together to deliberate and learn with each other. And there have been moments where we hit that nail squarely on the head and we did it beautifully and other moments where we haven't. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that we can create more spaces like Darius and other folks said, where we're doing exactly what we're doing today, but how we take what we're doing here out into the neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, with the people who we say matter the most and should be at the center of our work. So, so this question of democracy for, we're in the nation's capital. We're in the nation's capital. We have such an opportunity, I think, to remind, teach and evolve, not just our region, but maybe even the country of uh, what it means to be in community with each other and to practice democracy. So I'm just, this book, one of the questions we're gonna ask at the end y'all is, how do we, what do we do with this book and what we're learning, like who else should we be bringing into this conversation and how do we move from learning uh, to action? Um, so we'll be, be reflecting on that too. But last comments on um, uh, this question uh, that we're pondering at the moment. Silvana. Okay, besides the um, Ernesto and the hippos, which I'm gonna be, I just found the TED talk and I'm Rolling. so jazzed up about that. Saying, yeah. uh, I can't, I can't with the Italian and the hippos, but um, I, the thing that's really spinning me up, Jennifer, is um, what you were, how long ago was that? We started in the mid nineties and okay. yeah, so it, it was pretty close to two decades. Okay, so you know, you, you're doing it. Ronnie was doing it in the nineties and here we are, philanthropy is suddenly learning participatory grant making, right? But you know, okay, we're getting there. Uh, but the part that we haven't said yet today is that we are on stolen land as a result of genocide, and that continues in the world today. And we haven't talked about sort of the whole, the, the thing about, and I put it in the chat, ownership, the language, ownership versus stewardship. We don't have a choice, right? We're like, there's a gun to our head because everything's got to be about ownership now because we're in a capitalist society. But 
the real, the natural human way, indigenous way, any indigenous person will tell us, nobody owns it, we own it together, right? And that's why I know that's what you're talking about. I just wanted to say it out loud. And the indigenous people, you know, going back to the founding fathers, merciless savages, but we're going, you know, I pray every day that we're going to have we're going to reparations for descendants of enslaved Africans and land back for indigenous people so we can get back to what our true human state is. The thing I'm most proud of, Ronnie, that you said that the Community Foundation has done are one, like we invested in the planning and the seeding of a community land trust in, in Southeast DC called Douglas Community Land Trust. And it's, it's, we got 400 units. It's, it continues to grow. And our anonymous donor who helped seed this ensured through their grant that that board is not an investor board. That board is majority community residents. And this was like 10, 15 years ago. So that's, that I just had to put that out there. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Silvana, for that pivot. Um, so I'd love to talk about where have you seen philanthropy be courageous? Uh, philanthropy at the Community Foundation, philanthropy in our region. Um, we have some donors on the call, like philanthropy as an individual donor or someone else being um, courageous. Where have you seen where have you seen philanthropy be courageous? Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. um, I think that the reason we were having these big discussions in the 90s and are still having the same discussion is evidence of our falling back continuously um, to what is comfortable. And so it's hard. That's why the revolution won't be funded, right? Um, we we just the minute we're free to, we just slide back into what we know. So um, the issues around um, land, there we were always in the discussion about what do you what do you want to do. What, what do you want to do about this? You know, um, cause we have a lot of uh, indigenous communities in San Diego that were participating in it. And um, the decision-making had to arise out of those, the, the soul of those teams, right? Cause we would have come up with a very different strategy. Um, I think to your point um, that, there, there are individual cases of courageous philanthropy where somebody's breaking out of the norm, if that's how you want to define courageous. Um, you know, you've got a McKinsey Scott doing things really differently than the field has done them. Or I talked about Marion Rockefeller Weber in the book because yeah. she came up with this idea of flow funding where she just gives people a check and says pass it on where you see that it's needed and we actually tried it in our neighborhood where the neighborhood unity foundation just would give out checks <clears throat> and they were required to just report back on what happened with it <laughs> it was it was actually blow away it, for those of us who are used to reading proposals <laughs> it was, quite amazing the impact that that occurred without making people define outcomes in advance <laughs> so um so you have individual kind of people and projects that i'm aware of now i've been out of the field a while but um but what i don't see is foundations really daring to give up control. And I don't think people give up control lightly. I don't have any illusions that they're going to, but, 
but you know, our team's gotten called into, you know, hundreds of communities over the years and people say they want to do this, but they're afraid to get out of their office and walk down the street and take the hit, right? Because communities are pretty sick of foundations coming in and surveying them and not doing anything. So first of all, can the community itself survey itself? Because how Laotians talk is going to be different than how the Samoans perceive the world. So, you know, how do you do that surveying and community listening in a way that honors the diversity of those communities with a pledge that those residents who are doing it are going to come back and share deeply what that learning is and make an action plan to do something about the things that people want to do something about. So, you know, I think it's really important to engage in action and to see ourselves as partners and jointly responsible <laughs> for that action. So, um, I talk a lot in the book about being more courageous together. Mm -hmm. And I really came to believe that, that we have a lot more endurance for the issues and the barriers when we're together. Um, I think we're more courageous as teams. Um, individual foundations can take whatever hits they want to take. You're in a different situation in a community foundation you're more vulnerable to criticism. And so, you know, we had a team of 14 foundations that became serious resource partners that were willing to try something different in terms of supporting action on the ground. And we called it the San Diego Neighborhood Funders. <laughs> No proposals, all resident-led activity coming out of team decision-making. We were fast. We were flexible. We could say, you know, this group needs $5,000 for graffiti art or whatever, graphic design. It didn't matter what it was. And somebody else would go, yeah, I'll, I'll do the other five, <laughs> you know, just get it out there fast. And um we were always trying to make up new ways to get money to projects in a way that hadn't been done before. But we were able to, to kind of weather the criticism because we were, there were 14 of us in that group. And um, it's, it's a field of criticism, right? Being able to really handle criticism and take action that's necessary. So it does require the courage to give up not only control about the vision and planning that goes on, but get, give up control over how we're getting money out, <laughs> you know, to, to think that reading a piece of paper with our learning outcomes and our impact outcome is going to change anything. We've got to let go of that and get real and get on the ground and put teams as partners um, to be able to speed things up, to be more flexible, to report to the IRS on behalf of residents if that's needed. Uh, whatever's needed and to not let structures be a barrier to getting things done. Cause a lot of times the barrier is us. And so we've got to get in a situation where we can see it and be committed to, if that's not going to work, we're going to do it some other way. And we're not going to spend a lot of time researching it. We're just going to do it. And so I don't see that. I'd love to to know um, if those groups that are daring like that are out there. In my experience, people don't want to give up control. 
Wow. So y'all reflect on that because uh, we have about 10 minutes of discussion. <laughs> Uh, and I'm watching y'all's body language. I'm curious about how y'all would respond to Jennifer's question. Um, Sean, I see your hand up and then we'll circle back. Uh, yeah, actually the what I was thinking about um, kind of echoes a lot of what uh, Jennifer was just saying. Um, I especially like the point about um, like how to be courageous. And I think the things about, uh, you know, especially we're talking about like controlling capital is, you know, the same thing as ownership that we were just talking about before, um, you know, people not wanting to give up their own uh, ownership of, I mean, money, which can turn into, you know, any other resource or um, physical, you know, commodity that that you might want. And I think I think that's like, I, I, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> but um uh, what would like reflecting on courage and what you were saying uh, at the beginning of this call about like uncertainty and just going in and doing the project like to me I feel like that that's probably one of the the biggest like at least in philanthropy the most courageous thing is just embracing uncertainty um, and it and it makes it like the opposite of like finance capitalism which is all about de-risking and saying oh you know here's here's exactly like we have the data to prove that, you know, we won't have, you know, we'll reduce risk the most by by doing X, Y, and Z. Um, but there was uh, a book I read recently by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out a while ago, but it, it was um, a pretty short read about like um, people using like big data models and algorithms to, to make decisions. And then saying like, oh, because, you know, this model said the, <laughs> the answer, like this must be the correct answer. Um, but she had a really good quote that I keep coming back to, um, where she said that predictive model models codify the past, they don't invent a better future. Um, and I, I feel like that's like, I mean, like in, in so many situations, like even if we don't consider like an algorithm doing it, a lot of people, you know, based on research will make a decision. And that research again is, is looking at what happened in the past, but not telling us what could happen in the future uh, and so i think that that's kind of like like i i love science i actually studied physics uh in college but um i'm very much against the the kind of like hyper rationality of a lot of um uh yeah like um economics and and sciences that that are used to um yeah prevent prevent change or prevent uh you know innovation in in social situations or political situations um yeah so that was my my kind of thought like that's that's how philanthropy i guess should be or could be courageous is embracing uncertainty which i, I think you know you, you kind of said that as well um yeah wow wow well we have exactly 10 minutes and like a good song uh, it's getting really, really good here at the end. Um, can folks stick around for another couple of hours? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I saw Alan look up like, what? Um, so let's continue to reflect. Um, and maybe there'll be a part two to this conversation. If there's anything that's hot or emergent that you're not getting to say that's bubbling up for you, please put it in the chat box. We're able to save all of this. Um, we want to be able to to track that. But let me just say, is there something hot, um, urgent, that's like bubbling out of your soul that you want to put on the floor before we uh, move to close? I got to say that I'm really proud that our community foundation is engaged in advocacy the way that it is around budget and policy advocacy. And even in really, really difficult times, when our partners, both public and private partners, may not want us to be using our voice. And nice. we continue to do it. Nice, nice, nice. Don. Hi. Tell um, them who you are. Huh? Tell everybody who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Don Leary uh, with the Greater Washington Community Foundation. Um, thanks, Jennifer, for this conversation. Um, I was just curious about um, an experience maybe you had in philanthropy where 
um, maybe it was a time at Casey when Casey was kind of, um, and I remember that time because I was working in Ward 8 and Casey was in Ward 7 uh, for five years. Um, but where community or community stakeholders that were closer to those issues um, identified something that was in uh, contrast to what philanthropy was doing, whether it be an approach or, and just sort of what that process of was like of, of letting go. Because I, I just, I just want to name like, how difficult it is, right? Especially when the machine of philanthropy is on that path and it wants to continue with that path, but community is saying, hey, this is something different. Um, and just to share what that experience was like, I think it would just be helpful for the conversation because sometimes I think also the risk-taking is being willing to lean into the uncomfortable. This isn't easy. This isn't, uh, you know, um, one and done. And so I just would just would love your your perspective on sort of the grappling and what was that like in terms of philanthropy beginning to say, hey, okay, we need to kind of we need to let this go. We need to do something different. Yeah. Well K Casey was a great learning partner. <laughs> Partly, but what was interesting about it is th they did three rounds, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, of of 10-year uh, community building work, and they were way out in front early on. Um, but, but Ronnie, after you left, I was called in to look at their plan, and they were doing the same thing they had done 30 years earlier. <laughs> so... They documented all these learnings, but they weren't operationalizing any change. So I, you know, I do think um, <clears throat> that we had to, as our little group, start wherever we were. Like, just don't wait to figure it all out. Just start and grow it over time and let it decide itself who it's going to be and how it's going to be. So we had a few um, uh, core values and, um, and then we did a pinky swear on the resident <laughs> led part of it. And then we let the group grow <clears throat> in its experience and, and in size. Um, eventually we had hundreds of, partners, but um, it, I think um, it's, it was shocking, you know, it was shocking to each one of us in different ways, um, but we just decided we were going to stay at the table and operationalize those values of risk and relationship and, you um, you know, operating in a, in a really different way. So, and to, to not just document the learnings, but <clears throat> to constantly being <clears throat> adjusting to how we're doing things. And people took surprisingly really big risks. I mean, Market Creek in terms of scale, and it was just the first 10 acres <laughs> out of 50, um, it was twenty three and a half million dollar project with the risk of construction. You're talking about really a lot of financial risk. So um, we were just a, willing to not let anything be a barrier that we were doing. That was our mantra. <laughs> so we couldn't find a construction company to assume the risk of training on the site. So we became the construction company. We couldn't find a leasing agent to take it on because of the neighborhood it was in. So we became the leasing agent. We, you know, <laughs> we, ended <Wow>. up, <laughs> we ended up with about 20 LLCs. I think, cause, and if you couldn't do it in a nonprofit, could you do it in a for-profit? <clears throat> if you couldn't do it for profit, can you do it in a nonprofit? So we were, we had literally probably 20 different corporate structures, S corps and 
LLCs and nonprofits and community found a community foundation. So we were just committed to not taking no for an answer. And we learned never ask your lawyer if you can do something or not. <laughs> like, just ask them how to solve the problem. <laughs> Uh, because the the legal parts of it is what scared people the most. I mean, once they got used to being called racist, <laughs> having to deal with their own understanding and learning and rewriting history in their heads, um, the biggest barrier was always they were afraid of what their lawyers told them they could do and not do. <laughs> like, no, you can actually give directly to individuals you just need, you know, a fiscal agent basically that will do expenditure responsibility. Well, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's just, it's just not that hard. Somebody can take that responsibility. Um, we pass those things around in terms of responsibility. So I think when I started, I was saying sometimes learning is just putting people in a set of circumstances that we have to learn our way out of. So here we are and we got to learn our way out of it. So um, so I was really surprised that so many people stayed at the table that long. I mean, first of all, we'd never made more, in our community, had never made more than a one-year grant. <laughs> and of course we wonder why nothing lasts, right? So everybody, stepped out some people slower than others but because we were able to buoy each other up in terms of I'll write your IRS report <laughs> if you don't want to do it <laughs> you know um we 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 learned our way out of it by putting ourselves in the circumstances to to not let anything be a barrier wow wow well y'all Again, it's heating up right as we're getting done, and it is 1029. Um, and uh, Jennifer, I just want to say again how grateful we are that you are calling in from the West Coast uh, to be with us today. Two questions we did not get to reflect on together. In the book, Jennifer talks about her three big wishes. And... Uh, and so we'll figure out a way to do this with y'all, but what would be the three big wishes to change all of this? What would you do? Um, and then the second question we didn't get a chance to reflect on was who else in the foundation family should we be inviting to read this book? When, who, and how? And the good news is I'm already getting in the chat from y'all some places where we could land the book. So, so I'm just gonna put you out there. Silvana has sent me some comments. Marla, Dr. Dean, before she stepped off, sent me some comments. Um, and so um, let's be thinking about that and how do we create these spaces to learn, act um, in a, a profoundly different way uh, together. Um, all right, y'all, unfortunately we're at time. Um, can we give, uh, Jennifer kind of gleeful faces and a round of applause. And Jennifer, I think I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. Tony, if I am, let me know. We would love to figure out a way to get you and this content in front of a bigger segment of our foundation family and our philanthropic and neighborhood um, partners. And so please stay tuned. Um, let's stay in touch. Much love to you and Ron. Thank you for your courage and uh, know that you've got some folks that are in solidarity with you here on the other coast um, trying to do our own version of the work. Family, thank you all again. Um, it's Friday morning. It's almost Friday afternoon um, and it's almost the weekend. Um, we're into, into the holidays. Happy Hanukkah to our Jewish uh, sisters and brothers. Um, uh, Christmas will be coming up. So uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa and all the other holidays in between. Um, love y'all and look forward to seeing y'all, if not the rest of the month, in the new year. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. We'll be in touch. I'll call you Thank to follow you up. So Thank you. Great right. to hang Thank out you. with you this morning.